Welcome to the first of Rebel Wisdom's Conversations from the Edge. I'm Layman Pascal. I'm trying to grow an afro, and I don't think it gets much edgier than UFOs, an issue that has long epitomized many of the deepest problems around sense making. Despite massive and ongoing human experience of anomalous aerial and other phenomenon, for decades this has been dismissed from serious consideration relegated to an unreliable social fringe and placed in the custody of pre-rational conspiracy thinkers. Yet in the year 2021, we seem to be at some kind of inflection point. Credible witnesses appear regularly on podcasts and mainstream television. The CIA is declassifying thousands of files. The Pentagon and former President Obama have confirmed video and radar footage of objects they claim not to be able to identify and which operate in a manner unlike that of conventional physics. So when you take hallucinations, weather balloons, advanced drones, swamp gas, disinformation campaigns, and foreign superplanes off the table, what's left over? That's what we want to explore today. We all know that stigma disrupts healthy sense-making, so as the taboo might be lifting, we could be looking at a domain of knowledge that is becoming newly viable for science, philosophy, and the public to contend with. But who's an expert in this area? What counts as evidence? Are we being manipulated? How do we productively negotiate multiple overlapping perspectives? And how do we each distinguish between the noise of our instinctive bias and the signal of sanely evaluated information, especially in a world where maybe nothing feels trustworthy anymore? To quote Matt O'Dowd from the PBS Space Time series, it's never aliens until it is. Here to help us figure out if it is, is scholar, activist, philosopher, polymath, and founder of the Institute for Exo Studies, Sean Esbjorn Hargens. Hi, Sean. Hey, Layman. I'm surprised they're having you do this because you're so far beyond the edge that it doesn't even seem like you're qualified to do this new series. (laughs) I'm scaling it back a little. Okay. All right. Good. (laughs) All right, Sean. In the upcoming days, the Pentagon is supposed to deliver an unclassified report to the American legislature on unidentified aerial phenomena. At minimum, they're going to have to do some kind of acknowledgement for fuzzy footage of orbs, triangles and tic tacs. But at the same time, we don't expect them to be entirely forthright. So we're getting new information confirmed now, but we still don't know exactly how to hold that information. If there was ever a time we needed something like exo studies, it could be this cultural moment. Why is this happening now, do you think? And what exactly do you mean by exo studies? Okay. All right. Good. We're, we're, we're diving right in. So let me say a few things about kind of why now in terms of the UFO piece. And then let me kind of zoom out to just kind of the larger cultural moment. Um, and then we might have some back and forth in that. And then I can go into exo studies. Um, sure. So you know, there's, there's been an accumulation of UFO evidence over decades, right? So in a sense, it was only a matter of time before we kind of revisited the topic culturally to kind of re-examine, is there really anything here that's, you know, noteworthy? Um, Richard Dolan, who's, you know, a historian in the UFO landscape, has a great orientation to this, that, you know, disclosure, whatever that might mean, and we can get into that, but like the idea that there's some going to be some kind of big reveal um, around the the truth of, you know, UFOs in in some meaningful sense, that disclosure is both um, impossible and inevitable. And by impossible, he means that essentially it's so locked up into the national security state by which he's written two and is working on the third volume. They're each about 500 pages. So he's really done his homework and looked at the complexities of the national security state and different military encounters with UFOs since the you know, 30s and 40s up till present day. So there's a lot of you know, social complexity and political and economic complexity with the topic. And so, so it's almost like, you know, it's like, you know, it just seems impossible that the government would ever come out with anything, you know, like, like, why not just, you know, you know, play silent, you know, play dumb and just keep moving on, you know, and yet, you know, truth has this, you know, weird way of getting in through the cracks and and popping out and, you know, pulling down walls and and opening up, you know, new horizons of of sense-making. Tim McMillan launched his new website, thedebrief.org, several months ago with a report kind of a bombshell report, and he's done really great investigative journalism. He was an ex-cop and very interesting guy. But in this report, he talks about there being two reports that have been circulating within the intelligence community. 
And within those reports are high res photos and, and more um, sensory data. And I think maybe even some video footage associated with those reports. But the point that I'm making here is that when we look at the grainy videos of the Go, you know, Go Fast and Gimlin and Fleur One and all that, it's easy to look in those and go, well, you know, I'm not even clear what I'm looking at here. This could be any number of things. But a lot of people in the intelligence community and people in the know are saying, that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just what's been released to the public. There's a lot more data that corroborates those footages and other footage. And there's even really close up photographs, high resolution photographs of a triangular craft coming out of the ocean, <laughs> coming out of the ocean, right? And that is, there's a close up picture of that. So it's unlikely that kind of content is gonna be in the public facing version of the report coming out. But you know, people are very hopeful that the report will have at least something we can sink our teeth into. Now, zooming out in terms of the bigger kind of cultural moment we're in, the whole post-truth era, right, is upon us, you know, which is a big reason why we need um, communities of practice trying to, you know, do sense making, because you know, it's like, it's very destabilizing. And, and again, I think this comes back to the return of the repressed, the cultural shadow work we need to do, you know, the magic, the mythic, psychedelics, you know, in some respects, I think we're becoming a polyphasic society, Right, we're and hopefully we're going to go transrational instead of pre-rational. That might be an interesting thing to talk about in terms of sense making. Like, what is a transrational approach to UFOs and psychic phenomena and exo phenomena versus a regressive, you know, kind of pre-critical, you know, kind of emotionally driven approach to these phenomena and these experiences? You know, and, and Yates said it really well: the center cannot hold. You know, like I think we're at that point. The center hasn't been holding for a while. Things are spinning out. So there's some limits to the rational scientific modes of sense making that have dominated cultural sense making for a long time. And and I think we're in a meta crisis. You know, like there are so many crises happening on so many fronts: existentially, ecosystemically, social systems you know, ethics and worldviews and value systems, health, the pandemic, you know, terrorism, climate change. I mean, there's just, there's so many things happening that it's, it's like things are speeding up. And I think that's part of why this is happening now where things are quickening. You know? So it's kind of like, you know, it's like when you're doing a fast, right? All the toxins start coming to the surface, right? And you start, you know, expelling those from the system, right? So I think that's part of what the ball, body politic is going through, like we're, the, the, you know, and there's, you know, unhealthy expressions of it. And hopefully we can cultivate more healthy expressions, you know, and maybe this is part of game B, or maybe even Game C with C being consciousness, right? You know, where consciousness gets to come in and play a bigger role in our sense making. Because one of the fascinating things about UFOs is even though the, the majority of the content being cycled through the news right now is really nuts and bolts approaches to UFOs, there's a whole nother side about high strangeness that involves consciousness and our interaction with the phenomena, the phenomena's response and, and participation with us as embodied beings with cognitive capacities. And, you know, so, so there's a lot to explore here. So let me stop. So on the there. one hand, you're thinking there's been this um, gradual accumulation of data and experiences and evidence that at some point has got to break free and start cascading. Yeah. And on the other hand, we're sort of at a unique moment where the pressure of the mass scale multi-crisis that we're facing and the fact that uh, our sense-making apparatus for the world is sort of getting fuzzy and failing us. So we're reaching for something beyond what we've conventionally thought of as the yeah. ordinary paradigm. Yeah. So give us a give us a quick sense of what it is that you do with exo studies. And then I'm going to follow up on some of the things you already mentioned. Okay, great. So exo studies is maybe best defined as the meta-disciplinary study of anomalous experiences and anomalous realities. Okay. So that's that's the kind of textbook definition. Now, by meta-disciplinary, what I mean is kind of, you know, it's a meta approach, it's an integrative approach, but it's essentially drawing on 150 different disciplines or domains of knowledge acquisition. And, you know, so this includes you know, about 50 associated with academic or philosophical traditions, 50 that are associated with UFO or space studies, and then 50 that are associated with esoteric and or paranormal studies, right? So for me to, to understand anomalous experiences and realities, 
I feel we need to draw on all these different areas. And this has been part of the challenge of, you know, trying to study this stuff in the past is it's been very niche, you know, and, and it doesn't always get a meta view. There's so much great content out there about, you know, the universe and human beings and how we fit in and how we interact with things that I really want to marshal as much understanding from all these domains and then aim them at, you know, how do we understand anomalous phenomenon? And for me, there's a particular focus on non-human intelligences, right? And the ontology of subtle realm phenomenon or, or realities, right? Because I just find there's all these reports that people throughout history and, and contemporaneously talk about, you know, whether it's on, you know, in psychedelic experiences or in any number of other contexts, there's all kinds of so-called contact modalities, different forms of meditation um, and so forth. But people are encountering various forms of intelligences that seem to be something other than human beings, right? So I'm very curious about that because I, my sense of the cosmos is that it's, it's saturated with intelligence and all kinds of different embodied expressions. So I'm curious about that. And then another big part of exo studies is, you know, what Jeff Kripal, you know, religious studies scholar at Rice University, talks about as the paranormal as non-dual sign. In other words, anomalous phenomenon are like these little windows into the non-dual nature of reality. Because these, you know, phenomena, these paranormal phenomena are kind of like pulling the rug out from underneath us. So I'm interested in the nature of reality. And one of the best ways to understand the nature of reality is to look at anomalous phenomena that don't confine themselves to our particular map of what reality is. And so, you know, it gives us a sense of like the, the weird and wild, you know, cosmos that we live in. For me, I focus on in exo studies, though other people taking an exo studies approach would not need to focus on UFOs, but I'm focusing on UFOs because I think there's a lot of evidence. There's more legal evidence than scientific evidence. So that's an interesting distinction we can get into. Um, but there is some good scientific evidence. Um, it's also, so it's very scientific. It's also very religious and spiritual. So I find this very interesting about the UFO phenomenon that is both scientific and it's both kind of religious, spiritual. And it's also galactic. You know, I, I feel like this is where we're headed developmentally. And, you know, it's like with Elon Musk putting us on Mars, you know, we're, we're en route to becoming a multi-planet species, though we might be a multi-species planet as well in terms of, you know, some of the other intelligences that might be here. Um, you know, so, so that would be, you know, one kind of quick overview of exo studies. Sure. Great. Uh, it seems to me that one of the problems is we're not exactly sure what's anomalous and not anomalous mm. and what the right. boundary is between exo and maybe endo. Like, right. for example, I've seen some footage of some pretty advanced human made drone like craft that might be able to move between the air and the water and deflect radar ripples. And we right. certainly anticipate that the so called military industrial complex has technologies right. more advanced than what we're currently used to. So that seems conventional. Yeah. Meanwhile, a guy like Lou Elizondo from the Pentagon's Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program is on 60 Minutes saying these things are doing 700 G-forces. They fly at 13,000 miles an hour. They evade radar. They fly through air, water, and space with no obvious propulsion and defy gravity. So that doesn't sound like an advanced version of an existing technology. Mm -hmm. And if it's been happening for decades, centuries, or millennia, then it's extremely unlikely to be the Chinese. Right. Uh, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's exactly yeah. what it is. So I guess what I'm asking is, how do we negotiate the boundary of what we call EXO, right? When yeah. we're wondering, is this ultra tech or a psyops program, are we being sensible or are we trying to evade the strangeness of the whole category of the EXO and just hunker down in our current ontology? When is yeah. something legitimately EXO? Uh, when does it count as no longer just a misreading of ordinary phenomena? Yeah, no, it's great. And I, and I think that's part of the inquiry, right? And, and you're right. It's like the five observables that Lou Elizondo, you know, has identified as being, you know, kind of qualities of maneuverability that have been observed in the UFOs. We find those going all the way back to the 40s, right? And it's very obvious the Chinese and the Russia weren't having craft in the 40s that could demonstrate the five observables. So that's another whole another interesting um, point. And, and yeah, what's inside and what's outside is going to be shifting. The goalpost is going to be changing on that. Right now, we have a very conservative, rational, scientific, materialist view of what's inside. Right? You know, you look at indigenous cosmologies, 
right? And where, you know, nothing is, is outside, right? <laughs> they, they are able to include it all, right? So yeah, I think that's important, you know, and so I'm fine with the, the, where the line of EXO is to keep changing. For me, it's about the curiosity of kind of re-examining our assumptions about the nature of reality and to keep opening it up to the mystery, the multidimensionality, you know, the uh, multi-layered nature of it, um, you know, because, and, and the other part, one of the core concepts I develop in exo studies is the notion of doubleness. And doubleness refers to how the phenomenon consistently, whether we're talking UFOs, poltergeists, Bigfoot, ghosts, you know, psi phenomenon, you know, whatever your anomalous, you know, flavor of choice is, all of these phenomena demonstrate doubleness, meaning that they are simultaneously subjective and objective, their mind and their material, their inside and their outside, their self and their other, their time and space is all mangled together in curious ways, right? So there's something about the phenomena where even, you know, exophenomena have this doubleness where they're both outside and inside, right? Like that's kind of the nature of what makes it so, you know, kind of nonsensical and, and high strangeness is because it doesn't fit in our categories, right? And this is the, the big thing that I think a lot of this phenomenon is doing is it's challenging our categories. And this is why a lot of people think of the trickster and the trickster archetype as being part of what's going on. And Jacques Vallée, you know, and others in the late 60s basically said, UFOs are not, you know, you know, space brothers and sisters and metal craft coming to visit us. It's too strange. The reports are too bizarre, like something else is going on. And so they moved from what's called the extraterrestrial hypothesis to like the extra dimensional hypothesis saying like, there's this whole other thing going on here. Right. So, you know, so there's, there's so many ways to, to understand what's inside and what's outside. But I think we have to move away from this rigid sense of, oh, reality is in this really small, you know, rational scientific box. So what, what do you think are the most important reasons to challenge our basic ontological categories? Like, why do we think we have to answer this in terms of something that exceeds the normal subjective objective boundary? Uh, and if that's the case, what does that tell us for our general sense making about reality going forward? Yeah. I think one one thing I would say is I often see the UFO phenomenon, exo phenomenon in general, as being a catalyst for integral consciousness, right? That it has the the catalytic capacity to move us towards more dynamic, complex modes of sense making, right? Where we're basically it's like it, it supports us in developing paradoxical thought, right? You know, where like multiple contradictory realities can be in some meaningful sense true at the same time. Right. So so that would be more the trans rational, you know, kind of direction that interaction with this phenomenon can can generate. But also, you know, people get freaked out and people devolve, you know, and they 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 fall down the evolutionary scale, you know, and and go from their rational selves to their, you know, emotive, emotive, you know, mythic modes, you know. So so there's that, you know, dynamic as well. Um, you know, my sense is that, you know, you know, Kant, you know, bless his heart. You know, he he really instituted and the folks around him at the time and since then have really instituted this idea that we can't say anything about the thing in itself. Right. That what's real is outside of our capacity to comment on. And so we're, we're trapped with our structures of, of sense making as they show up in our psychology, in our human embodied experience. And so this has led to a number of problems, you know, with, you know, intellectual you know, pursuits and scientific pursuits. And I think part of what's happening, if you look at the academy and you know, that there's this ontological turn where we're returning back to questions of ontology, questions of what's real. And, and, and this is important because it's been hundreds of years since we've allowed ourselves philosophically to ask ourselves what is real and how do we investigate what's real? How do we verify what's real? And so I think part of this is that process of of shifting this, you know, and there's a number of cool things that have happened. Like Jack Hunter has developed this notion of ontological flooding, which is essentially, you know, instead of the Kantian move, which is, okay, I can't say anything about what's real, but I can just talk about my experience of it. Right. And, and so, and that's called phenomenological bracketing, where you say to yourself, I'm just going to focus on the experience of the phenomenon, but I'm not going to make any claims about the, the realness or non-realness of the phenomenon. Ontological flooding is the counterpoint to that. 
it's opening up to the what ifs, right? It's like when an indigenous person tells you something as an anthropologist, you don't just in your back of your mind go, oh, those silly natives, they just don't get it, right? It's like your ontological flooding is like you, you really take seriously what this person is telling you as being ontologically the case. And that's your starting point and not in a non-critical way. Right. And then also, if you look at like Philip de Scola's four um, full typology of ontology, he basically shows how and there's four, but I'm just going to focus on two, how animism and naturalism are the inverse of each other in terms of their ontological and epistemological commitments. And that the human beings the world over have essentially take up one of these four strategies for sense making around ontology, around what's real. And, and since Western naturalism is just one of those four strategies, do we then just assume that, that the Western naturalism has gotten it right and that's the, the, the primary and main form of what's real? And then his colleague, Eduardo um, Viverios de Castro, has talked about how in the Western world we have a mononaturalism and a multiculturalism. Whereas in the animist communities, particularly in Brazil, that you have the opposite. You have a multinaturalism and a monoculturalism, right? It's the exact opposite. So I think these things challenge our sense making. They challenge our Western notions of what's real. And I think to be a global civilization, I think we need to make room for other forms of what's real that are not tied to a Western naturalism. Like we need to make more room for the diversity while still being in pursuit of, you know, the key critical questions that, you know, ontology and science can provide us. But I think we're moving towards both a weird realism and a participatory realism. And I think we're going to get drug kicking and screaming if we don't do a better job of kind of exploring these topics. Well, speaking of diversity, um, there's sometimes a criticism from the progressive and the metamodern left, which right. says UFOs are not only a distraction from serious, urgent social issues, but that the uh, the quasi mythological interest in these topics is a form of aborted critical insight into the ideology of our society. You know that. Yeah, something very significant and alien feeling did start happening mostly in America after the Second World War that involved secrecy, manipulation, the military industrial complex, right? And something sinister that's going on in the background of our socioeconomic system yeah. that we're maybe missing or not seeing deeply into enough because we get excited and we stop at this uh, visual mythological version of it. So how would you respond to that kind of... Uh, you know, social leftist critique that there's a danger in giving attention to these topics and that what we're seeing are people who um, need to see more deeply into the structure of the society we inhabit. Yeah, I, absolutely. I think that is happening. And, you know, here's another example of the doubleness. So that's true. It's dangerous to give, you know, room to this topic. Absolutely. For the reasons that you've stated and other, you know, associated positions. And it's dangerous not to give room to this topic, right? You know, and so I think part of it is that our whole scientific apparatus has been castrated in its ability to investigate this phenomena in a scientific and a post-materialist way, right? So I think as a result, we tend to see more the pathological, the, the socially distractive, you know, the mythological, the unhealthy mythological, the, you know, motive, the narcissistic elements of this. But, you know, honestly, having delved into this, you know, pretty intensely for the last few years, I find that to actually be a minority of what I experience in interacting with people who are serious intellectuals and practitioners and experiencers going into this topic and trying to make sense of it, right? And one of the things that's so painful is so many experiencers, and I find that there's more and more of them than we realize, whether it's UFO experiencers or anomalous experiences and so forth is that they feel like they're going crazy, right? Because they're in a culture that makes them feel like they're crazy for having these experiences, which for all intents and purposes are extremely real. Even though we might need to try and figure out what do we mean by real, they're real powerful, you know, transformative experiences. Many people who spot a UFO for five minutes when they're 10, that they report that being a defiant, and I don't just mean a light in the sky, you know, like, like a really substantial sighting, you know, really obvious that it was a craft, really obvious that it wasn't, you know, um, you know, um, ours or, you know, China's, it affects them for the rest of their life. 
right? It's like a five minute moment and boom, you know, for the next 40, 60 years, like it's a significant moment, right? So I think part of, you know, what needs to happen is we need a higher order level of discourse around these phenomena so we can make room for the intelligent conversation to talk about weird things, right? And then we can parse out the parts that are not so helpful, that are, you know, narcissistic, that are, you know, problematic, that are, you know, distorted and so forth. Well, let's talk about some of the options in that higher discourse. It seems like there's maybe three general explanatory discourses among people who take this stuff seriously. Uh, the simplest one is usually that we're looking at crafts or vehicles that come from another planet where their civilization had a bit of a head start or some kind of psychobiological advantage. And that's plausible enough because we calculate a very high likelihood of life evolving on other planets. Yeah. And despite the well-known relativity theory speed limit, there are many interesting ideas about how gravity waves or wormholes or other potential forms of physics might be able to bypass that limit. Now, maybe the second most common explanation that I come across anyway, is that we're looking at a, a phenomenon encroaching into local space time from a higher or other dimension. And that might explain the apparently erratic and impossible motions of objects being woven through our 4D space time. And thirdly, there's this discourse around uh, the idea that these phenomena should be grouped with angels, demons, psychedelic elves, and other anomalous shamanic entities that maybe always have been operating as a subtle aspect of the terrestrial biosphere. And maybe there's a fourth scenario where our whole reality is a computation and anybody can tinker with the code any way they like. Right. So yeah. what do you make of these sets of explanations? How do you weight them differently? Yeah. And how's your sense of them evolved over time? Yeah. In an article I wrote last year called Our Wild Cosmos, which is about 50 pages in length, um, I map out 10 major hypotheses that are, are common in the literature. And in my general sense is that they're, you know, they're all right. They all help explain some of the phenomenon, right? And Kripal refers to the UFO topic as a waste bucket um, problem, meaning that basically everything gets put in the, the UFO category, right? And so it's like, there's a lot of things in that category that are, you know, legitimately UFOs, and then a lot of things that probably are something else. And this is also, you know, part of the challenge of exophenomena is because there's so many different phenomena that are wrapped up and linked with um, UFOs. You know, people who have experience of UFOs, often then, you know, it's not uncommon for them to have a, then a poltergeist in their house following that encounter, right? Or they, you know, see cryptids or, you know, so there's this phenomena is, is kind of hyperlinked to itself in really bizarre, complex ways, which is why the high strangeness got played down by a lot of the early ufologists, because they were afraid that if they let in the high strangeness into the reports, they wouldn't, they were having a hard time being taken seriously as it was by the scientific and academic community. It was like, there was no way in hell they were going to like let in Bigfoot into their report on the UFO encounter, right? You know, so, so there are a number of really good hypotheses, and I think some are do a better job of explaining more of the phenomena than others. So let me just briefly run through them. There is the extraterrestrial hypothesis, which is essentially what you started out with, the first one. Then there's the extra dimensional hypothesis, um, and, and that was your second one. But then this has some interesting variations, right? Because there is, you know, there can, you can go to the demon, angelic, celestial realm, right, uh, as, as part of that. Or there's the ultra terrestrial hypothesis, which John Keel and even Jacques Vallée and others have, you know, really embraced, which is that there is some set or group of beings that have lived on this planet in another dimension for a lot longer than we have. And they've basically been here and they just continue to kind of, you know, interact with us in, in dynamic ways. And so that they're not extraterrestrial. If anything, they're kind of intra-terrestrial, you know, you know, living in the earth or in the oceans in fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh dimension or what have you, right? And Lou Elizondo even kind of, you know, pointed to this possibility um, in a recent interview he was doing with the basement office, right? The other one that's really interesting is the time traveling um, hypothesis, which is essentially that the greys, uh, which is one of the main of, of the, there's five major types of ETs that are reported over and over again in the literature, um, short and tall greys being two of them, but that the, the greys essentially are ourselves from the future time traveling back, right? And so there's a lot of different things about that possibility. Then there's the dark military hypothesis, which is essentially 
the, the military has these advanced capabilities and they're responsible for abductions or false flag events and that they're using kind of UFOs that we've created um, either through back engineering or through you know, our own breakthrough science and that they're conducting a lot of the things that are reported as UFOs. And so, but it's kind of, you know, really secret black budget stuff. So the dark military. Then there's the psychosocial hypothesis, which kind of takes, you know, Jung as kind of the, the granddaddy of this approach, which is that this is some kind of collective archetypal phenomena where um, because we're living in a highly masculine technical society, that there's ways in which our collective energies are able to manifest a UFO that actually gets a radar return. And so it has a physical dimension, but it's, it's basically a form of group psi, right? Or there's some kind of archetypal energies that get activated. Then there's the earth light hypothesis, which is basically that you have these orbs and balls of energy that are happening along tectonic plates or along ley lines. And that there's g you know kind of you know geographic you know features and you know elements of the earth that are combining to create some of this phenomenon. Then you have the intrapsychic view, which is basically it's all happening in someone's mind, right? That this is just you know psychological, subjective, projective. Um, then you have the artificial intelligence view that a lot of what we're seeing is basically kind of you know robots or drones that are being flown in and there aren't actually biological creatures in these craft. Um, and then you have the breakaway civilization um, view, which is that you know there's a good reason to believe that the US government figured out anti-gravity in 1954, right, or thereabouts, and that we've been developing anti-gravity tech since then, right? You can look at Nick Cook's book, The Hunt for, for Zero uh, Energy. And, and so there's this idea um, that I think, you know, substantiated in some important ways that there's kind of a secret, you know, subgroup of people you know, in the hundreds of thousands or even millions who have had advanced tech for a long time, and they essentially constitute a breakaway group or a breakaway civilization. And that, again, many of the UFOs that are spotted are actually theirs, or they could even be our own secret budget stuff, right? So my approach to all of this is that all of these are partially true, most likely in, in certain circumstances, or at least need to be considered and engaged with you know, in a serious fashion. And so I developed what I call the mutual enactment hypothesis, which is basically looking at how multiple elements of the system and the interaction between us and them, the visitors, are mutually enacting um, the phenomenon that's encountered, right? And so they're bringing something to the party, we're bringing something to the party, and there's a dynamic weird dance that occurs as a result. How I don't see how we could possibly do a sufficient Occam's razor with this. Like you're saying, hey, we've got to take all of these seriously and right. engage. But how, how do we decide between them? Is that even possible? And how do we do that in a way that doesn't just fall into whatever personal instinct we have on the subject already yeah. to either embrace or dismiss? Yeah. Well, this is why, like, I'm really wanting to help and work with others to develop what I think of as an integrative meta science, right, of, of UFOs and anomalous phenomena. And this is why the, the metadisciplinary approach is important, right, because we can draw on a lot of great things that are happening in different disciplines. We can develop new forms of validity. In contrast to Occam's razor, I often talk about Pollock's brush, right, Jackson Pollock's brush, right, because when you analyze his paintings, there's these incredible meta patterns, right, it looks like chaos. But when they're analyzed by computers, there's this fascinating kind of deep structure to the paintings, right? So I, I take a very paradoxical view. Take things seriously, hold them lightly. The doubleness and then Occam's razors and, you know, Jackson's um, um, Pollock's brush, right? You know, or, you know, so I feel like we have to keep approaching this phenomena in a paradoxical way phenomenological bracketing, ontological flooding, right? And we shift back and forth between these modes in order to keep, you know, bringing up the possibilities. And then I think we need to pioneer new distinctions, new forms of discrimination, new kinds of validity, right? And, you know, I think that's what this phenomenon in part is asking of us is to like, you know, raise the bar with our capacity to engage, you know, like, um, I love the concept of Pollock's brush. That's uh, entertaining. Yeah. Um, we're coming up on the breakout rooms pretty quick, but maybe you want to say a few minutes about how you come into this. How did you get involved in any of this, Sean? Yeah, thanks. So, 
you know, as, as many people who know me or know of me, you know, I've been just a diehard Wilberian for a long, long time, you know, so Ken Wilber's work's just been a really crucial part of kind of my integrative thinking and, and development. And, you know, and, and, and building on that, I started getting interested in, in Roy Bashkar's work and critical realism and Edgar Morin's work and, you know, complex thought. So I've always been interested in like, what are the big integrative meta theories that try and describe all of reality in, in an honest, you know, complex, like, you know, holistic way. And alongside that, I've been a very serious spiritual practitioner. And I kept having spiritual experiences of phenomenon that didn't really fit in Wilbur's map. And, and because a lot of them were more of the subtle realms. And, and I wasn't finding my own experiences being kind of taken seriously in the context of integral theory. And, and so as I kind of, you know, grappled with that, um, I just found that I, I kept having what I would call galactic experiences with galactic intelligences. And, and I just couldn't not acknowledge that that was happening to me in some important way. And so as I started talking about that to more people, I started having a lot of my, you know, good friends basically start telling me their experiences. And what was really curious to me about this was these were people I'd known for 10, 15, 20 years who told me all about their psychedelic trip, told me all about their ayahuasca trip, told me all about their profound meditative experience, but they never told me about the graves who showed up in their room late at night one time, or they never told me about the blue being who has encount they've encountered four times throughout their life, right? And so as I started coming out more with my crazy exos, you know, experiences, I started realizing that so many people in my immediate community were experiencers of exophenomena of one stripe or another. And that made me realize like, okay, uh, let, let me just come out more with this and let me try and develop kind of an intellectual framework that can help all of us make more sense of this, right? And so, so I come at it from a very kind of, you know, integrative meta theory perspective, but also what's really driving that is just a set of my own experiences and then just really listening to friends, colleagues, and people I've met along the way who have had profound exo experiences that I think we need to take seriously and we need to find a way to bring that into the conversation. What is the shadow content that's getting integrated if we do shadow work with these things, Sean? Yeah, so, I mean, part of it is that one of the things that really got me interested in this topic was I kept bumping into the taboo around talking about UFOs and how, you know, as an academic, you know, really noticing when other academics were basically saying, I don't want to talk about this because I don't want to lose my reputation. I don't want to like, you know, deal with the consequences. I don't want to sound crazy. So as I kept bumping into that in all kinds of contexts, I just thought like, what is the taboo? Like, you know, because it's, it's really odd because our best scientists basically say it's very likely that there's life out there, right? That, you know, like even recently this last year, there's an article that, you know, in a mainstream kind of scientific peer review journal that said, According to their estimates, there's 36 intelligent civilizations within the Milky Way, right? You know, so you have these kinds of scientific voices, that, you know, or even um, um, Avi Loeb of Harvard, you know, the former chair of the astronomy um, program with his view of Amuamua being, you know, an interstellar, you know, light cell. And, you know, so, so you have these kind of scientific view that, of course, we're not alone. And yet, you know, and that's kind of what I call the SETI view right? The search for intelligent, extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, and, but then when they don't want to have anything to do with UFOs, right? They don't want to, you know, it's like we, there are aliens, but they're really far away. You know, like they're, they're not visiting us. They're not here living among us. They're not in, you know, the ocean. Um, and so I found this really odd. It was kind of like, it felt like intellectual dishonesty, you know, when you really kind of look at, you know, all the variables and at least, you know, intellectually dishonest in terms of not being able to have the conversation. So I think part of what we gain in terms of the content is we lift the taboo, we make it more legitimate to have this conversation about the nature of reality, UFOs, what are the different hypotheses, what may they or might they be. And so then we get to talk with intelligent people ourselves about weird things, right? And so then, then we'll discover what the content is. Part of this, we don't know what the content is, is because there's been such a heavy taboo and a repression of this. But I think part of it is a more sophisticated understanding of magic 
of of the value of mythological, you know, you know, thinking and 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 mythopoeos, you know, and mythopoetic, you know, orientations, an expanded view of science, um, a, a more mature form of spirituality, right? So I, I think you know the content kind of remains to be unearthed because part of it's like we don't totally know what it is because we've done such a good job of kind of excluding it from the conversation. Um, but I think another layer is about our situatedness on this planet, in this solar system, in this Milky Way, right? Like this galactic orientation. I think as we go into this content more, it, it's like that moment when we had the picture taken of the Earth, right? You know, and we could see the Earth from the moon for the first time. And it's like that was a very powerful moment for humanity. I suspect a similar moment is going to occur when we are on Mars, when there are human beings living on Mars in the next five to 10 years, you know, and, you know, and so we're expanding as a species, as a humanity. And so I think part of the content is we're going to develop a more complex view of humanity that probably includes beings that in some cases look like us and in some cases don't look like us, but are intelligent in one way or another. Right. So I think those are some of the, the elements of the content I suspect will be part of this excavation process. In terms of some of my own galactic experiences, um, you know, I've had, um, you know, in meditation primarily and, and also just in, in waking state, I've had, you know, interactions with what I've experienced as being, you know, different kinds of ET beings or galactic beings um, or extra dimensional beings. Um, you know, one series of encounters involved getting what a lot of people refer to as a download, where I had a lot of information in my mind that I actually couldn't account for how it got there. And it allowed me to build a bunch of three dimensional models that was way out of my wheelhouse. And, and the experience as I explored, where is this coming from? Why is this happening? What is this about? That process kept leading me to a sense of interacting with different, you know, non-human intelligences that were somehow interfacing with me and giving me that information for, you know, reasons that I'm still not fully clear on. Um, and, and then also, you know, in talking with a lot of other experiencers about their own sightings and encounters, um, there's just been a kind of, they, they weren't my galactic experiences, but there was a way of just feeling the veracity of that experience and really trusting what they were saying and and really allowing myself to open up to wow we really live in a wild cosmos like there there's a lot of things that go on that are way beyond our normal sense of reality and then that's also you know kind of expanded my sense so kind of in a good integral move it's like i have my first person experiences of uh, galactic second person experiences of being in dialogue with people and then third person, you know, kind of analyses of the evidence and the arguments and the material and positions that are out there. And so, you know, combining those three kinds of investigation, you know, have just supported all three together. Well, there uh, is an interesting question here from Eric Leungberg, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Maybe he would unmute and ask it about connecting these two different realms of study. Mm. Yeah, first of all, thanks, Layman and Sean, for a really interesting and uh, stimulating exchange. I'm um, just picking up on that there's kind of two uh, tracks here, one about uh, like uh, UFOs and kind of the physical stuff, and then there's these subtle yeah. uh, downloads and this. So I guess just, I'm just struggling to, to picture a universe where, where both of these fit. Like, right. are there gross realms, aliens, and subtle yeah. Realm aliens. Like, yeah, great question. I'd be really connected? curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, based on my limited experiences and then based on just a real deep um, review of the literature, the experiencer literature, and also in talking with a lot of experiencers, um, my sense is as follows there are biological ETs. Um, and that are flesh and blood, and they come in a variety of shapes and sizes. So there's different kinds of biological beings that are, you know, extraterrestrial um, for all intents and purposes. Um, and there are um, more interdimensional beings that are more in light bodies or in subtle bodies. And in some cases, those beings can 
um, phase into and manifest a physical body in this realm or phase out from a physical body into a more subtle body and kind of phase out of this realm. So you, you have both kind of physical beings that don't seem to be able to do that. You have subtle beings and, and light energy beings that are, you know, seem to be just subtle beings that don't have what we would think of as a physical body, um, but they do have a body. It's just a kind of an, a, a different than our, you know, very dense physical body. And then you have beings that seem to be able to, for short periods of time, kind of, you know, transition between those two modes of embodied expression. Um, so all of that seems to be going on. There might even be some other variations as well. What I keep finding is the cosmos is really weird. And, you know, almost if you can imagine it, it's some version of that is happening, right? You know, so um, great question, yeah. Eric. Thank you. Terrific. Um, Yosarian has a question about government intelligence agencies that might be interesting, if you could unmute. Hi. Um, thanks so much. Really great nuanced and deep conversation and just coincidentally i didn't realize that um until you shared that information and the text that i'd been looking at what's up with ufo's website oh, recently and I found it really great i was like okay this is a really deep nuanced perspective on it um so my question is basically around that um i mean you described me earlier i at 10 years old saw something that kind of got me interested in ufos for decades I've also had weird psychedelic experiences around it. And I've been following this, you know, Do Richard Dolan and tons of the other researchers for years. Um, but I am finding myself highly skeptical of the Pentagon's um, sudden direction. Right. And so while I, I believe that there's something going on out there or here, um, I'm really skeptical of the potential for, you know, dark projects that have been funded for 50 years and now they can finally bring out secret fake ufos or that they're just trying to you know have another psyop or they're letting russia and china giving russia and china information to make you know put them off off the path and stuff so i just wondered if you'd speak a bit to the to that challenge of like how <laughs> you know what do you tell someone who kind of believes in UFOs but doesn't really trust what the government's telling you? <laughs> no, it's a great point. And there's a lot of good reasons to not trust what they're telling us. There's, I mean, especially in this topic, right? There's a long, well-documented history of them not, you know, being straight up with us, you know? And uh, so, you know, it's like the idea of a U.S. government cover-up is, is not even a conspiracy theory. Like it's a conspiracy fact, right? And if you do your homework, it's very clear and obvious. Now, how people interpret that beyond and you know, expand on that, you know, then sometimes there's things that are justified and not. But, you know, I think we have to be skeptical and critical and inquisitive and, and ask tough questions. Also, I think we need to be careful not to relate to the US government as a monolithic block, as like the US government is doing X or, the, you know, the Pentagon is doing that. If anything, it seems that there's a lot of different infighting and different factions, some of which are wanting more information to come out and some of which that are not wanting more information to come out. Some of which are really nuts and bolts in their orientation, some of which are much more into the consciousness side of things, and some of whom have a stronger religious kind of demonology view of, of what's happening, right? So, so within the Pentagon and within the intelligence community, even you know, in the larger context, there's a lot of different kind of perspectives and groups and infighting and positioning. And part of what we're going to start seeing more of, I believe, is basically a sense-making war around how to spin this, right? Because everyone's going to want to spin it in their particular way. And I don't mean that in like some nefarious sense. I just mean human nature is such that if you have a strong military orientation, you're going to emphasize the threat narrative in one way or another. If you have, you know, a strong economic viewpoint or, you know, a, a strong kind of spiritual viewpoint, you know, like there's there's just going to be different ways we make sense of this. And, and because we're in this post-truth era, there's going to be a lot of different competing narratives around what does this all mean, right? So I think we need to be in dialogue, like in communities like this and in, in other communities of practice to help us navigate those narratives and to kind of sort out like, you know, what can we trust from what the Pentagon's doing? I think there's good reason to say that the Pentagon doesn't like the position it's in around this topic and that Lou and others and Chris Mellon have kind of managed 
to like get this ball rolling in a way that they weren't happy about. Right. And so, you know, and we can talk more about some of the data points that kind of, you know, I think support that view. Um, but it's curious. It's like, you know, why are they so quick to come out and verify some of this footage? And then why is the, the report probably going to be a nothing burger? You know, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of questions. I don't think we're going to have good answers for a while. But I think, you know, we have a front row seat to a very historic moment because we're in a different position around this topic than we've, you know, really arguably been, you know, from the beginning of it in the 40s and 50s. Um, you know, so, yeah, I think we're going to just have to talk with a lot of different people to try and sort through the different possibilities. You know, but I, I caution people from like looking at someone like Lou Elizondo and saying, oh, he's a disinformation agent. Like, I find that kind of simplistic thinking not helpful. Like, you know, when I listen to Lou, when the research I've done on Lou, like, I feel like he's, a, you know, he's doing the best he can in a complex situation. I don't trust everything that comes out of his mouth, you know, but I, I feel like, you know, that I don't necessarily go to a place of saying, oh, he's a disinformation agent, right? You know, like, so I think there's the way a lot of people make very simple, strong claims, trying to reduce the complexity of what's happening. And so I would caution against that because that is what lends itself to conspiratorial thinking, right? Is, is taking complexity and reducing it to a simple, very simple narrative because it allows you to dismiss it or not deal with it, right? You know, even disinformation agents give you a mixture of truth and falsities, right? So you have to sort through that. <laughs> Sean, there's an ambiguity around the military, which is yeah. on the one hand, we have a lot of reasons not to trust them because we think of them as operating strategically, even in their right. communication. Yeah. But on the other hand, we trust them to keep us safe from a great yeah. many things. What's your take on the potential danger, right? Is there a reason to think we might be at threat from some of these things and therefore it might legitimately be something for the military to take care of? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, one of the things, if you look at the history of encounters, you know, back to the 30s and 40s, you look at all the encounters around nuclear facilities, and this is very well documented. Basically, every nuclear facility in the U.S. and also in Russia and China report continuous UFO encounters, not daily or weekly, but like there, there's always a history of UFO encounters around those facilities, or even like our nuclear subs and battleships and so forth. And, and they're often turning our nukes on and off. They're often you know, basically showing us that they're in more control of our nuclear arsenal than we are. And so there is an ambiguity because on, on the one hand, that nothing could be more of a national security threat than that. <laughs> like, like, you know, like that just ticks the boxes of like, holy smokes, you know. Um, and yet the government for a long time has said it's not a national security threat. And so, you know, the, the way it's being approached now more so is like around hazards, like in-flight collisions, you know, pilots, you know, making, you know, difficult maneuvers, trying to chase a UFO or get away from one and that that could cause, you know, an issue. So it's more around kind of safety is like one of the narratives that's being highlighted more around this as a safety issue for our pilots and, and crew um, people. Um, and, you know, but there is always the national security threat. And, you know, Richard Dolan with his two big books kind of lays that out. Um, one of the arguments is that given the tech we're seeing and that's been documented since the 40s and given their ability to turn our nukes on and off, if they wanted to be a threat, they would be much more of a threat than they currently have demonstrated. So they don't seem to be a militaristic threat, even though there are cases like in Brazil where UFOs were zapping people with lasers and they got wounded and had medical issues and some people have died in relationship to UFOs. So there are fatalities associated with UFOs, but it's a very minor, you know, it's a minority of encounters that involve that kind of situation. I think the, you know, if you really look at the, the experience for literature, I think the threat is more in terms of um, the subtle realm and our minds and, and thought control and mind control. And, and that's even more scary, right? And I don't even think we're ready for that conversation. You know, so I think, you know, some of the so-called negative ETs are, are not overtly militaristic in the ways that we often envision a la, you know, um, Independence Day movie and so forth. Um, I, I think it's more subtle and it's, it's, it's even more kind of concerning, right? So I think but that's, um, uh, that's all I'll say right now. <laughs> so a lot of these phenomena are uh, depicted as sort of passive. Something happened to me, I suddenly saw a thing, but there's a subset of people 
who are engaged in a more psychologically proactive attempt to be in contact with these phenomena. And I think Hugh Simpson has a question around this, if you'd like to unmute. Yeah, um, I was just wondering about the sort of the can you can you contact and do you believe can you contact people through telepathy? Uh, is is that a is that a thing you believe in? It's something like Dr. Stephen Greer talks yeah. about a lot. Um, yeah, so Greer's done a great job. I mean, you know, for all the possible critiques of Greer, I think one of the huge contributions he's made is the development of the CE5 protocols. And CE5 means close encounters of the fifth kind. So the first kind is just seeing lights in the sky, basically. Close encounters of the second kind is it's the encounter is close enough. There's some kind of physical effect, even on yourself, like biologically or on the trees around you know, the area or you know, some kind of physical interaction. Close encounters of the third kind is actually sighting a being or an interaction with a being. Close encounters of the fourth kind is abduction. And then close encounters of the fifth kind is basically intentionally calling in um, contact. And so Greer and others have developed kind of meditative protocols where they'll go out to different areas and use group meditation and group consciousness and group intention to basically send out, you know, kind of a signal. And then they've developed a process of often, you know, getting contact and seeing, you know, UFOs come in, come in closer, sometimes even interactions with, you know, beings and kind of a transphysical mode of manifestation, you know, kind of on the ground interacting with them. And, you know, so, you know, and there are other people besides Greer who are developing CE5 protocols. And so that is a real phenomenon. You can interact with, you know, and, and have encounters with, you know, this phenomena through that process. In addition to that, you know, there's an organization that was around for a while called FREE, um, the Foundation for Research on Extraordinary Extraterrestrial Experiences that was founded by Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut on, the, you know, from the moon, who also founded IONS, Institute of Noetic Science or Studies. And, so he and a group of people created this free survey and, and basically got, you know, almost 4,000 experiencers to talk about their encounters with, you know, non-human intelligences. And while like 30% of them were of a negative encounter, you know, and some of which included abduction-like experiences, the vast majority were positive encounters, you know, 70%. And one of the things that survey did is it documented that people are using all kinds of different what's called contact modalities to have interactions with these beings, you know, psychedelics, meditation, breath work, um, biannual beats, you know, ecstatic dancing, um, out of body experiences, near death experiences, lucid dreaming, all these different modalities. Actually, if you go into the, the literature associated with them, you will find people using those modalities who from time to time, report encounters with what would typically be called an extraterrestrial, right? And so, so there are a wide range of contact modalities that seem to be entry points through our consciousness interacting with these other forms of consciousness. You know, in the DMT literature, there's a, you know, they do a great job of looking at the ontological status of these beings that are interacted with in DMT trips and, you know, and in hyperspace or, or hyper real, right? So I think we're just beginning to kind of scratch the surface of the, the different kinds of meditations that allow us access to interact or have telepathic communication. In India, it's not uncommon for many yogis and swamis to talk about meditations that are basically out of body astral travels to other worlds and interactions with other kinds of intelligent beings, right? So, so this kind of material is in our contemplative literature and traditions much more than we realize um, you know, even Tibetan Buddhism, I've talked to two different kind of Rinpoches and people very learned in Tibetan Buddhism who independently told me that Dzogchen, which is one of the highest set of teachings in the Tibetan tradition, is being taught on 13 in 13 different star systems. Right. So so something like that's like really hard to know how to relate to. But it's it's an interesting consideration that some of the highest teachings of a contemplative realization on our planet are being taught on other planetary systems, you know, like, so it's like, we might live in a much bigger galactic, you know, world than we realize and are just starting to kind of come to terms with that. 
So we're getting pretty close now to the end of our first conversation from the edge, but I see there's a couple of questions here around uh, Descola's four ontologies. Maybe you could just quickly clarify those and let people know where they could follow up on that if they were interested. Yeah, so um, Philip Descola has written a book called Nature and Cult- or Beyond Nature and Culture, and he's a French anthropologist. And, you know, it's a great book. You can find good kind of summaries of it online, you know, different articles. But basically, he has a fourfold system. You have animism and naturalism. You have totemism, you know, like a totem pole. And then you have analogism. And so these four are basically, you know, all kind of opposites of each other. And they are built around the idea of whether interiority is the same or different or whether physicality is the same or different. And so those are the four possibilities of different combinations. So with naturalism, the body is the same. So there's a mono nature, nature exists outside and it's it's always the same. Um, And there's a multiculturalism. So interiorities are different. In um, the animism, it's the opposite. So there's multiple bodies and there's a singular um, interiority. And this is why personhood is granted to so many different phenomena, because basically subjectivity is, is existent across all phenomena, whereas the shaman has to change his body in order to go into different worlds or realms, right? So there's this body shifting dynamic, and it just opens up to you know, a whole different view of, of reality. And you know, there's a guy, Eduardo Cohen, who's written a book called How Forests Think, which is a fascinating you know, kind of non-human anthropology um, that, that looks into some of this. Um, so anyway, so yeah, check out Descola's work. It's, it's really accessible and it's really fascinating. I've got one last question if we've still got a minute for it, which is why is America so central to this? Are other countries doing it differently? Have they been in the foreground? Why do we constantly feel like we're waiting for the Pentagon and the U.S. Senate before we can change our mind on this? Yeah, this is a really important point because the UFO phenomenon is a global phenomenon. And, you know, people in the South American countries have a lot of experiences. They have a lot of different countries have different UFO departments. Um, There's like three or four countries that have their own UFO department that basically researches UFO encounters. Um, You know, America's dominant because of a lot of complex national security reasons. And, and basically, America has put itself in the driver's seat on this topic. And so you have to basically read, you know, a majority of Richard Dolan's thousand page you know, book on, on the topic to fully grasp like how and why that's the case. But there are interesting examples like with France. France doesn't have a very strong national security orientation to the phenomena. They have, you know, in, in, in 1999, they put out the Cometa report, which was basically a really well done report from a scientific group of, of people looking at the phenomena. So they have a much more scientifically driven approach. Um, we've always had a very military um, approach to it. One of the wild cards is what happens if Russia or China decides to disclose something about the phenomena before America is ready to do that. And so, so it's an interesting consideration of kind of the global geopolitics around you know, these dynamics. You know, and, and since there's good reason to believe Russia has recovered craft, the US has recovered craft, China has recovered craft, and have been doing so you know, since the 20s, 30s, and 40s, that they're all been working on this kind of competitively behind the scenes, right? And this might be one of the reasons why the US now is moving forward with some of what it's doing, because it's trying to get in front of the narrative in relationship to China or Russia's um, approach to the phenomenon, you know, but there's, there's a, a lot that can be explored and considered in this context. Well, this has been terrific, Sean. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. And I really appreciate the, the balance of groundedness and openness that you bring to this discussion. Thanks, Layman. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense-making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight-week online course, Sensemaking 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Musho-Hamilton, John Viveki, 
Doshin Roshi, and more. Improve your sense making, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same. <laughs>